Okay, I'm seeing a couple of people putting um, into the Q&A that they are not able to see that link. So let me go in and see if I can. We're going to wait just a few minutes um, to let everyone get into the webinar here today. Um, I do want to be able to <clears throat> um, share it with our, our Facebook feed. So I've found that when I do that, it kind of closes out uh, folks from joining the webinar. So I'm going to wait a few minutes before I, I send it over um, to share with the Facebook feed so we can make sure that we have um, as many folks as possible join us today so that we can get good questions. Um, and I hope you all are here for backyard vegetable gardening. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Got about 50 people with us so far. So welcome. Uh, yes, I had a question in the Q&A as to whether or not this would be recorded. And yes, it, it is recorded. And um, we can share the link um, later via email if you send me an email and request it, or um, we'll be sharing it on our social media pages as well. So yes, there, this will be recorded and will be available. All right, I'm going to give us until I'm going to give us probably one or two more minutes and then I'm going to go ahead and stream it over to Facebook and we'll get started. Thank you for being here and for your patience as we um, let folks kind of get into the webinar here.
Um, so we just had a question um, asking about our in-person workshops and, and seminars, and absolutely that is something we generally do. I am based in Manatee County, um, but due to the current situation, we've moved a lot of our um, educational opportunities online. And so some of these uh, kind of general topic uh, classes that we would normally do in person, we've, we've transitioned to an online format. And we're going to be focusing more on kind of skills building workshops in person. So um, that was a good question. Okay, well, welcome um, everyone. We are um, <clears throat> recording and we are also um, streaming to our Facebook page. Um, let's see, I want to make sure that you all can see my screen. Good. So, we're here today to talk about vegetable gardening in Florida, um, whether in your backyard, front yard, side yard, um, but this is vegetable gardening for the home grower rather than at like a commercial scale. I am uh, Alyssa Vinson. I'm the residential horticulture agent for the Manatee County Extension Office. And this webinar is offered um, in partnership with Manatee County Libraries, specifically the Palmetto Branch Library. And I wanted to give Eileen Valdez from Manatee County Libraries a chance to introduce herself and talk a little bit about the libraries. Hi everyone. Um, again, I'm Eileen Valdez with the Manatee County Libraries. I'm the assistant supervisor over at the Palmetto Library. Um, thank you, Alyssa, for offering this program and um, a couple others that we're going to have throughout the summer. Um, so, uh, as everyone is obviously well aware, we have been closed since about mid-March, but as of next week, uh, we will start offering curbside service for holds pickup. And we're hoping tentatively at this point to reopen to the public at limited capacity starting the week after, so starting June 8th. Um, that's all, you know, subject to any change by our county administration, but, um, you know, keep track of our, our social media and our website for all that. We've been offering a lot of different Zoom programs and um, recorded videos. So if you check our YouTube and our Facebook, you'll see some of the book clubs and um, other fun events that we have coming up as well as um, our recorded like story times, craft videos, things like that to keep people um, up and running. So hopefully we will be back to some sort of normality in the next few weeks. So we're, we're happy to at least offer this and hopefully we'll be able to see everyone in person soon. Um, so now I'll give it back up to Alyssa so we can go to our vegetables. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. I really appreciate um, being able to, to work with you and I look forward to doing more programs um, in partnership with the libraries. Um, as I said, uh, we're going to talk about backyard vegetable gardening today. Um, and I'm located here in Manatee County, Florida. Um, if there are folks from other locations in Florida, this information will still be relevant to you. Before we get into the meat, I wanna talk uh, just briefly about what Extension is. Uh, I think that some people know us and the people that know us really love us and rely on us and then other folks don't, don't really know who we are. So um, Extension is a function of the land grant university system in the, in the country. And we are part of the University of Florida's IFAS Extension. So that's the 
Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. There is an extension office in every county in the state of Florida, and each um, extension office is going to house agents who have different areas of expertise. Um, my background is actually uh, in ecological sciences, but I work a lot in um, landscape ecology and, and urban landscapes and so I also manage the Master Gardener Volunteer Program, the Master Naturalist Program in Manatee County. Um, we have a uh, cattle program, livestock program. We have a sea grant agent who deals with marine fisheries. We have folks that help with commercial agriculture, um, vegetable growing, nurseries, folks that deal with the professional landscape industry. We really have a whole, um, a broad scope of offerings uh, at the Extension Office. And our mission is to take research that is conducted at the University of Florida and other land grant universities and provide that information to our communities in a way that's accessible and helps to sustain and enhance the quality of human life. Uh, so that's us, that's Extension. Um, and I, I wanted to, to touch a little bit on some of the impacts that we've had in Manatee County specifically. And these are, um, you know, we're still crunching our 2019 numbers, but this is in 2018. We had over three and a half million dollars um, in value of the CEUs provided to pesticide license holders. Over uh, $650,000 was the, the value of volunteer time. So our volunteers put in over 10,000 hours, just the Master Gardener program puts in over 10,000 hours of service every year. Um, over 17,000 youth were educated through the 4-H program and other youth programs, and 29 million gallons of water was saved to Manatee County Utilities customers. So you can see that our impacts are very broad, and this doesn't even touch on, on all of the things that our um, office offers. So that's us. That's Extension. Please utilize us as a resource. That's what we're here for. So we're going to do a quick question to get us started and launch this poll. And if you would go ahead and just answer these few quick questions, we can get an idea of um, who our audience is. So are you from Florida originally? Have you lived in Florida for more than five years? Have you tried to grow vegetables in Florida? Um, if you have, have they been successful? <laughs> um, and which of the following is the most descriptive reason you are interested in this webinar today? And I'll give you about 30 seconds or so. <clears throat> Let's see. I'm interested to see. Yeah, that's, that's about standard for our programs looking at the breakdown of people who are from Florida originally. Okay, I'm going to give you just a couple more seconds here to answer these questions. All right, go ahead and share results so you all can see them. So um, of our audience today, 73% are not from Florida, which is uh, pretty, pretty common for the folks that we see um, in our audience. So that means that uh, about a quarter of you are from Florida, and that's good. You should have a pretty good idea of um, kind of what to expect as far as the reality of gardening in Florida. Um, folks who have lived in Florida for more than five years, that's good. So um, about 75% have lived in Florida for more than five years. So again, should, should have gotten used to kind of our seasonal cycles a little bit. All right, good. Some people have tried to grow vegetables before. And number four, need tips for success. Okay, is the, the most common one. And then some folks are new to gardening in general and others are just new to gardening in Florida. So good, we should have um, some good information for you today. So you wanna grow vegetables, right? Uh, here in Florida, that can mean many different things. Um, usually when I think of growing vegetables, my mind immediately goes to the juiciest, reddest tomato, right? That's, I'm, I am originally from Indiana. And so growing up um, in Indiana, we had great soil, delicious tomatoes all summer long, right? Big, juicy, beefy tomatoes, put them on a slice of bread with some mayonnaise and that was a sandwich. Um, so one of the things that, that I wanna kind of 
uh, start us off with is, is you know, growing vegetables in Florida might not be what you expected, um, but there's really an interesting mix of different types of varieties that we can grow here that you wouldn't be able to grow other places. And one thing that I found is that I might not necessarily get that juicy beef steak to you know cut a two inch slice out of and throw it between two slices of bread, but cherry tomatoes do excellently. Um, for a very long time, you can get uh, some really good varieties that'll grow lots and lots of cherries for you. So um, thinking about you know, changing your expectations a little bit, it can be, can be a good place to start when we talk about uh, growing vegetables in Florida. There are um, some easy steps that we can follow to, you know, make your backyard vegetable gardening project a success. And we're going to talk about those, um, you know, in detail. We, we've got our site initially, planning um, based on, on what we have available, what are our supplies, our resources, talking a little bit about plant selection, should you transplant, should you seed. Uh, we're going to talk about soil. We're going to cover um, compost, cover crops a little bit, talking about pH and fertilization. Um, scouting and pest management, so what to look for. What does it mean to be organic, not organic? Um, what does that mean to the backyard gardener? and then harvesting and use, making sure not to forget that last um, really important step. So as far as site is concerned, um, one, of the, one of the questions we get, you know, a lot of people have oak trees or other kind of canopy trees and they wanna know how much sun does their vegetable garden need? And a good rule of thumb is that you need about six hours a day um, of full sun, that's, that's not filtered light, that's full sun for your vegetables to really thrive. If you live in a coastal community, you know, we do have some folks that live out on um, Anna Maria Island or down in Longboat um, or areas that, that are uh, susceptible to a lot of salt coming over on the wind, maybe they're, they're just, they just happen to be close enough to, to the coast. So, one of the things to consider is that most vegetables have a really low salt tolerance. So you might need to search out for some alternative varieties and we'll talk about some of those. And you may also need to consider container planting rather than trying to grow in the soil. You may have too much salt accumulated in your soil. You may um, uh, have other considerations. It may be just too sandy to make sense. Um, so, so those are some, some things to think about with your proximity to the coast. With water, you want to know what is available to you for irrigation. Are you hooked up to the municipal water supply? Do you have well water? Um, if you have reclaimed water, the current recommendation is not to irrigate food with reclaimed water. So you're going to want to find an alternative water source for your vegetable garden if you right now have um, reclaimed water as your irrigation source. Do you have an irrigation system in place? Are you going to need to install one? Are you going to use temporary irrigation? These are all the types of considerations that you should be thinking about when you start to plan for your vegetable garden. Here you see an example of a raised bed design. And again, this can be really helpful for us here in Florida um, for many different reasons. We have very sandy soil. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. We have very sandy soil. It uh, drains very quickly. We tend to have um, issues with nematode pests. And we also have folks who move down here uh, after they've retired, and maybe they don't want to be kneeling down on the ground and, and working, you know, directly in the ground, and raised beds can give an advantage of having some accessibility. Uh, so raised beds might be a good choice for you. Containers might be a good choice for you. A lot of folks are using... Um, kind of the earth box design where you have a reservoir at the bottom of your planting, uh, planting container and then you plant above that in a media that then wicks up to the roots and you're not doing any overwatering. you're just um, allowing the roots to get the water and that can be beneficial for a number of reasons as well. When you're planning your vegetable garden, right? You have to think about, okay, do I have enough sun? Where is my water? What kind of water do I have? You also want to think about what types of plants you're going to plant. And I am 
so guilty of this, where I get an exciting seed catalog in the mail or in my email inbox, and I start clicking through all those really interesting seed varieties, and I think, ooh, I need that one, and that one, and that one. Um, and, and you really have to do your research on the plant and determine whether or not it's going to be reasonable for you to plant it here in Florida. I included in the chat box at the very beginning, um, if you scroll back, uh, it should be the only thing in the chat box, but if you look there, um, you'll see a link to the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide. That's where the majority of the information in this presentation um, comes from. And they have some wonderful tables there that you're gonna see in, in the presentation. And one of them is here. These are suggested plant varieties for Florida gardens. So this is based on research that's been done by the University of Florida. And they recommend specific types of beans. Um, arugula, beets, broccoli. So you can see, um, you know, bush beans. You're going to want to get Blue Lake, Contender, Provider, something like that. And those are proven to do really well um, here in Florida. And there's going to be additional notes and remarks there. So you'll see um, bush beans mature early and do not need staking. That's good to know. You know, you might think, oh, I've got to build a trellis for my beans. Well, not for bush beans, right? Bush beans are going to stand up on their own. So you'll find all of this information again in that link that I provided you and you'll be able to um, choose some good varieties. Now I don't discourage you from trying other varieties, um, especially heirloom type varieties. They can be really fun uh, to grow. You're not quite sure what you're gonna get sometimes. You'll get really interesting color variations. Um, but I would recommend that if you're going to go with the heirlooms, you also plant some of these recommended varieties so that you can feel successful. <laughs> One of the things to think about uh, here in Florida is our planting calendar is very different than it would be in other parts of the country. So we are uh, subtropical here in Florida and our um, while our winter uh, tends to not be very cold, it is our dry season as well. Um, so we do have two very distinct um, seasons wet and dry. So our, our winter tends to be our kind of dormant period for our plants. Um, things are, are pretty dry as far as rainfall goes. Um, and then our summer is obviously very rainy. You can pretty much count on, at least here in Manatee County, every afternoon around three o'clock, uh, you're gonna get a rainfall. Um, there have been some wonderful calendars that have been put out and they're available in this really handy kind of infographic um, format that tell you when to plant um, and um, by what method to plant certain types of vegetables. Uh, so you'll notice that the state on this um, image is split into north, central, and south. And folks in the south region, if you're at kind of the north end of the south region, you can get away with some of the central recommendations and the same goes for central and north. There, you know, there's a little bit of mixing there at the margins. Um, don't take it as hard and fast, but um, generally we would be considered central. Um, and so if you look here, edibles to plant in September, right? September is a big planting season for backyard uh, gardeners. And if you lived in Illinois, you would not be planting in September because you would be worried about that first frost and you wouldn't want um, your plants to die. So here you can see in central Florida and they tell you easily survives transplanting. So that means you can go to the store, you can buy a start of this plant and you can transplant it into your garden and it, it likes that, it does well. Um, some plants will survive careful transplanting, which means they're a little bit more tender. They don't like it um, quite so much as the others. And then for some species, it's important to just use seeds. Um, you're going you're gonna to direct sow them right in the area where you want to grow them. So some examples of this, if you wanted something that is easily surviving transplanting, things like peppers or lettuce would be a good thing to plant in September here in Central Florida. Something that survives careful transplanting would be um, celery or spinach or carrots. With carrots, um, you want to be certain that when you're transplanting them, right, you think about the root is what you're trying to harvest. So any damage to the root 
during that transplant process is going to change the um, ultimate appearance and uh, size of your harvestable carrot. So, so those are definitely a little bit trickier than some of the others. And then beans, radishes, turnips, things like that, you're gonna to want to just use seeds directly where you are planting. But what about right now, right? What can I plant now? I'm really interested. You know, maybe, um, maybe you are stuck at home, working from home. Maybe you're at home a lot more than you ever used to be and you really wanna start a garden now. Maybe you are a little bit worried about the availability of vegetables. Um, you know, you saw the run on grocery stores a couple months ago and you thought, wow, maybe I should do more to grow food for my family. Those are all good reasons to think about, um, to think about planning for vegetable gardens. Um, this time of year is a pretty light season as far as planting is concerned. You'll notice edibles to plant in May and we're here right at the end of May, almost June. Uh, really central sweet potatoes and Swiss chard are the only things that are being recommended for transplant and then okra and peas, southern peas, uh, like black eyed peas would be something that you could plant now in central Florida um, in May and you would be able to um, kind of keep those going. Now there are lots of other types of vegetables out there though. Um, there are food crops from all around the world that we can plant here in Florida. There's also the Everglades tomato that will over summer. Um, I've had really great success with winged beans and there are lots of other um, tropical and subtropical varieties. And we're gonna talk about some of those on the next slide. So interesting alternatives, right? We all want that big juicy tomato, but sometimes we can't have it. Maybe our site isn't quite right for it. We need to plan a little bit better for what's going to do well, particularly for those folks that live in South Florida. Um, they really have to kind of think outside the normal box. So some of these um, vegetables that you see here on this slide are some options. There are many, many more. This is a photo of jicama, which if you um, have ever had it, it's kind, I kind of refer to it as like a potato apple. Um, it's juicier than a potato and you can eat it raw and it's really good in salad. Um, but, but it is, it's kind of, kind of potato-y and it's kind of apple-y. Um, but jicama can grow here in Florida. Um, you can grow it over the summer. Um, things like amaranth. There are different types of amaranth varieties that you can grow for their uh, leaves. You can eat the leaves or you can harvest the seeds. Um, it's hard to grow a real appreciable amount of amaranth as uh, grain amaranth here um, in a backyard garden, but you could do it. Cassava, um, chaya. Chaya is a really interesting tree. It's also called the spinach tree. Edible hibiscus, there are a couple different edible hibiscus varieties. There's one that's just a green hibiscus. You can eat the leaves like spinach and there's another that's called the cranberry hibiscus, which is a deep burgundy color. It's really beautiful if you are considering edible landscaping where you wanna to try to incorporate edible plants throughout your landscape rather than just having kind of a dedicated garden area. Malabar spinach is great. It, it does wonderful. Um, some people don't like the uh, texture of it. It's kind of like okra in that it has a little bit of a mucilaginous nature to it. But if you cook it, uh, it's pretty good and it grows very well. It doesn't grow like a typical spinach, it is a vine. Um, so it's a good idea to have a trellis. Okinawan spinach is another alternative green. This one doesn't have that mucilaginous um, uh, kind of texture like the Malabar spinach does. And then there are things like bunching onions, different kinds of garlic chives that you can grow as well. And um, there will be a, a reference at the end of the presentation to a document that was put together by a place called Echo Farm, um, which is down in Southwest Florida. Uh, I highly recommend reading some of the information they have available. They've done, um, they've done a lot of work in trying to figure out what kinds of tropical food crops grow uh, here in, in Florida. So they have a lot of resources for some of these alternative varieties. Okay, question break again. So we've, 
we've planned, right? We've thought about our site. We know how much sun we have. We know whether we want to have a raised bed or a container or we want to incorporate edibles throughout our landscape, right? But what's the next step? Well, we have to consider our soil. So what type of soil do you typically find in your yard? Go ahead and answer the question. Okay, we've got 80% of you have voted. Go ahead and give you just a couple more seconds. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end that poll. And I'm gonna show you the results. And that is pretty much what I expected. Um, what type of soil do you typically find, right? People are gonna find sand here most often. I wanna know who the two people are that have rich soil <laughs> um, and whether or not they've, they've done any work to amend it. Clay, we do get clay um, in some areas, particularly East uh, County and here in Manatee County, there are areas with clay. And then some folks have a mixture of above. Um, <clears throat> If you live in a new development, um, it is highly likely, and I'm talking, you know, your house was built, you know, between 1995 or so and today, right? It would be a good idea if you're planning to do a garden bed in the ground, and this goes for any type of planting. If you're gonna be starting a landscape bed, if you're putting down new sod, if you're starting a vegetable garden, you're gonna to wanna to go out and check your compaction levels of your soil. Some of these newer developments, most of them, in fact, because there's been so much heavy machinery moving across the, the ground, a lot of the, um, the soil that is used for, for where the houses are built is coming from, um, you know, spoil from building stormwater ponds. So you end up with a lot of compaction in the soil and it makes it really hard. Uh, there's also, um, there tends to be a lack of organic matter and a lack of kind of um, the natural microbiome that you might find in soil. So, so thinking about those things, you wanna go out, you wanna take like a bamboo stake you wanna to try to poke it into your soil. If it easily goes into your soil about six inches, then you're good. If, if it's hard to get that stake through the soil, then you've got some compaction issues and you should probably consider doing a raised bed for your vegetable garden, container plants, or you're gonna to need to really get in there, work that soil and add some organic matter. So I like this photo, right? Because we all have this idea about what garden soil is supposed to be. We want to put our hands in it. It should be moist and rich and it should smell like things are decomposing in it, but in a good way. Um, but what we really have here in Florida is a lot of sand. We have very sandy soil. Obviously, um, unless you live out on one of our islands or keys, you probably don't have pure white quartz sand. Um, but you probably have somewhere in, um, in between these two things, right? It's likely that you, you have some organic matter, but not a really high uh, concentration of it in your soil. So I always, you know, I kind of laugh when we talk about soil, because I'm like, oh, soil, ha, huh, you mean sand? Um, because we do, we do have a, a really high concentration of sand in our soil. Um, so how do we go from this kind of reality, this sandy reality to this ideal, nice, rich, um, organic, uh, and by organic, I mean has living things in it. Um, I don't mean that it has like a organic label on it. I mean that there are organic materials within the soil. How do we get there? Well, one of the things you can do is you can compost and then you can add that compost to your soil 
or if you aren't going to compost, you can buy compost. Um, things like composted cow manure, composted chicken manure, those can be added to the soil to provide some of that organic material. Um, we do have a webinar tomorrow on co composting. Uh, it's called Waste Not, Want Not. It's one of our Florida friendly um, landscaping webinars. So if you're interested in that, it is um, available tomorrow um, and you can find some information about that. But compost is great for a number of reasons. One of the main reasons is that the more organic matter you have in the soil, the better it's going to hold on to water. And since our soil here in Florida tends to be so sandy, when it rains or when we irrigate, the water really percolates through that soil very quickly. But the more organic material we add to the soil, the better its ability to retain water. Um, and along with that addition of that organic matter, right, as it breaks down, it's going to turn into nutrients that your plants can use. You know, some of the ancillary benefits can can go all the way out to you know talking about uh, reduction of food waste, um, waste reduction from our landfill systems, greenhouse gas emissions reductions. There's a, a really big list of benefits uh, to composting at home as well as utilizing that compost at home. One of the others is increased soil um, biotics or, or the bacteria and, and fungi that live in the soil naturally. There are over, um, you know, over 98 or so percent of all plants on the planet live in some sort of a symbiotic relationship with mycorrhizal fungi. So fungus are very essential to healthy soils. There are different ways that you can compost. Um, so you can do just your standard compost pile. You can have trench composting, which is really popular in um, permaculture. Um, you can do sheet composting, which I kind of call compost lasagna, um, or you can try things like worm composting, which is where you actually use uh, a certain type of species of worms, red wiggler worms here in Florida, to break down the, um, the vegetable scraps, and then you can utilize the worm poop, essentially, um, to, to add um, organic matter to your soil. And it's a really efficient way of composting as well. You can get a lot of compost in a short period of time when you're doing things like worm composting. Um, this is a, uh, an infographic that is available online. Um, I, I think it does a really great job of recommending things that you can compost, things that you should not compost. Um, we had a question in one of our last classes about um, pet waste putting pet waste into compost and don't do that. It's definitely not recommended. Um, and then using your compost, make sure that you're using it. Um, it's really, again, it, it is a really great way to help take our soil from that sandy reality more towards our ideal. All right, so time for another question. Okay, so the question is, do you currently compost? Are you interested in composting? Would you be interested in attending a webinar that teaches you how to get started composting? And this will help us, um, some of these questions will be used to help us plan for um, future webinar opportunities. So take that into consideration when you, when you answer. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end that poll. Okay, I'll share the results. So um, more than half of you do not currently compost, but that's interesting, that's a pretty good split. So that means that um, we do have a, a pretty high percentage as compared to the uh, general public. That's a really high percentage of people who are currently composting. Um, 
good to see that you're interested in it and you haven't been turned off by it, especially if you are currently composting. And great. And most of you are interested in um, learning more about composting via a webinar. So, so that's good. Um, <clears throat> Again, look for our Waste Not, Want Not webinar that um, is going to be tomorrow. All right, let's go ahead and continue on. So what about fertilizer? Right? This is a question that we get a lot um, in our Master Gardener Volunteer Plant Clinic. Um, we get a lot of questions about how do I fertilize, what do I fertilize with, when do I fertilize, can I fertilize in the summer in my vegetable garden um, because there's a fertilizer restriction. In my, in my community. And um, so we, we do our best to answer all those questions. We have some general recommendations for vegetable gardens. And that is that most garden crops uh, in Florida are gonna benefit from just a standard 10-10-10 fertilizer. And if you're not familiar with a uh, fertilizer label, it's gonna be NPK, so that's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, NPK, 10-10-10. Um, <clears throat> So most garden crops are going to benefit from kind of a standard 10-10-10. You can broadcast that, um, uh, just apply it to the soil before you plant your vegetable crops. One thing I would caution you of is here, particularly in Manatee County, it would be a good idea to get a soil test done to see if you need any phosphorus. We have really phosphorus rich soil in many parts of our state. That's why um, we have the phosphate mining industry here in Florida. Uh, so <clears throat> you may not need any additional phosphorus, particularly if you're planting directly in the native soil with some additions. Um, once you've done that original application of fertilizer, you can do two to three light applications throughout the growing season, depending on how your plants are um, are reacting to the addition of the fertilizer, how they're growing, are they growing well, do they appear like they're not really robust. Um, things like lettuce and kale, those, those leafy greens, they'll like a little additional side dressing of nitrogen, so you can give them a little scoop of, of nitrogen, um, and carrots and potatoes are going to like a little bit of potassium. You can do that in uh, potash. Um, so there are different ways to to get fertilizer, right? Uh, there are differences between organic and synthetic fertilizers. And you can also do things like fish emulsions, blood meals, um, stuff that comes from more um, kind of direct sources, kelp, uh, composted seaweed, things like that. If you're doing a lot of additions to your soil of those, uh, of organic matter at the beginning, you may need less fertilizer over um, the run of your garden. But again, these are just kind of general recommendations. And you can, you can follow these recommendations using, um, you know, organically sourced versus synthetic fertilizers, or you can just go out and you can, you can buy the, the synthetically sourced fertilizer as well. They're all nitrogen. <laughs> So you have figured out what your soil is like. You know where your irrigation is going to come from. You have a good idea that you want to do, let's say maybe one four by eight raised bed, right? Okay, so now how do I plant? Am I going to use seeds? Am I going to use transplants? Am I going to direct sow? Am I going to start them in a tray and then move them over? Am I going to have to consider thinning these crops after I plant them? Um, how do I actually physically put them in the ground? Some people um, have never planted a plant before. Now this group, I know, I noticed that only about 20% of you are new to gardening in general. Um, but, you know, first tip, roots go in the ground, <laughs> leaves go on top, right? Um, things that you want to look for if you're planting uh, transplanted crops. So let's say you've gone to your local nursery um, or big box store and you bought a pepper plant, right? When you select that plant, you're gonna to want to look at it thoroughly before you bring it home. You wanna look at the tops of the leaves and the bottoms of the leaves. You wanna check for things like chewing damage from insects. You wanna check for any kind of um, spots or molds or um, things that look like greasy spots. You're going to want to feel um, the stem, make sure it feels firm, not flimsy. It doesn't collapse uh, easily when you, when you squeeze it. And then it would be a good idea to ask the people that are selling the plants if you can pull it out of the pot a little bit and take a look at the roots. You don't want to buy something that um, 
in particular, if you if you start to pull it out of that pot and you smell kind of a sulfury smell, that's not good. That means that it has been sitting in water, it's been overwatered, and there's some kind of anaerobic decomposition going on in the soil. And you'll generally find those roots will be dark brown or black um, and, and they'll be decomposing. So, so you want to look at the roots. Roots should be white to light tan um, and they shouldn't be wrapped around um, in the shape of the pot when you pull them out of the pot. All right. <clears throat> so as far as whether you should plant um, according to seed or rather whether you should plant seeds or whether you should plant transplants, the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide is going to do a great job of giving you all of that information. So you'll see, we'll just go right here at the top with arugula, right? So in central Florida, in our area, you're going to want to plant arugula in September to March. That's the general range. Gives you information on the yield, so how much yield you can expect, how many plants you should plant per square feet, and your anticipated days to harvest that arugula. Now, for spacing, it's going to tell you how far apart your plants should be. And then if you're planting multiple rows of those plants, it's going to tell you how far apart those rows should be. Um, it gives you information on the seed depth. So in this case with arugula, it's a quarter of an inch. So you really don't want to push that seed down into the soil. And then there's this rating of transplant ability. So how well does that plant transplant? If it has a one, that means it transplants really well. If it has a two, that's that transplant with care. And if it's a three, that means that you really should not transplant it. You should be planting it by seed. Okay. So now you've got your plants in the ground. Um, ideally, you're gonna um, set your seeds in, you're going to place your plants, you're going to make sure that you account for mature size of that plant, and that's what that spacing uh, information in the table will tell you. <clears throat> then you want to water your plants in pretty well, but then how often do you need to water? Well, it's going to depend on where the plants are located and whether they're in containers, uh, whether they're in raised beds, what is the um, <clears throat> organic composition of the soil, all of those things are going to change how frequently you need to water. Um, generally, this time of year, because we're starting to get into our rainy season, if you have things planted right now, you probably don't have to do much supplemental irrigation because we're getting a lot of rain. If you have things in containers, however, containers are going to dry out much more quickly. So you're going to want to check them every day or so to make sure that that soil feels moist. Now, vegetables do not like wet feet. They don't want to be sitting in water, um, but you do want to make sure that there's adequate soil moisture. So when you squeeze the soil, it should, it should slightly stick together, but you shouldn't have any water running out between your fingers when you squeeze that soil. So you can go in and do the soil squeeze test um, every day or so just to check on that soil moisture. And you have lots of different options, right? Some of you have in-ground irrigation, but again, I would double check to make sure that it's not reclaimed water if you have in-ground irrigation, um, because we don't recommend using reclaimed water for food that you're going to eat. Soaker hoses are a great temporary solution. Um, you can lay them out in your garden in lots of different configurations. You can pull them out after they've been established and then just hand water as needed. Drip irrigation is going to give you a really great solution um, because it's going to apply the water directly where the plants need it, which is at the roots. So you can get some um, pretty easy drip irrigation kits to set up in your raised bed or even for your pots. Um, and I recommend because pots really do dry out very quickly that if you're, um, if you're going to utilize containers and you're not doing something that has the kind of reservoir at the bottom, like an earth box, then, then look into getting a drip irrigation system set up on a timer so that you don't have to go out and hand water all of those, um, <clears throat> all of those containers. Sprinklers are great too. Um, one thing to be aware of with sprinklers is that you're going to want to do that early in the morning. Um, and the reason you want to do it early in the morning is you want to give it a chance to evaporate off of the leaves of your plants before we, um, before we get into the evening. When plants hold moisture on their leaves overnight, especially here in Florida because of our, our overnight, um, our high humidity, it can lead to issues with, with fungus and bacteria. <clears throat> All right. 
one more question break. I promise this is the last one. I'm curious to see what type of irrigation system do you plan to use? Okay, give you a couple more seconds, and then I'll go ahead and end the polling. Stalling out there, about 88% voted. All right. <clears throat> so it looks like there's a pretty, <clears throat> excuse me, a pretty even split between folks who are planning on doing hand watering or a mixture of the above. And that's totally fine. <clears throat> Just make sure that. Um, if you're planning on doing hand watering primarily, that you give yourself uh, reasonable expectations for how often and how much time you're gonna have to be spending out there. One of the nice things about setting up a timer is that you don't have to think about it, right? Um, so you can put your garden in the ground and you can walk away pretty much and then three months later you get peppers. Um, <clears throat> I mean, uh, there's a lot more that goes into it, but but watering doesn't have to, have to be your primary concern. So with hand watering, just Think about um, the amount of time you're ready to spend um, doing that chore. Um, I'm glad to see that about 5% uh, of you have a rain barrel. Um, we do have a rain barrel class coming up next month. So if you're interested in rain barrels, I would, um, I would check it out. They are a really great way to store water, um, you know, capture water during the rainy season and then have some water to use in your garden um, during our dry season. Okay, so you've got your plants in the ground, you're, you've fertilized them, you're watering them, they're growing. <clears throat> now you have to think about maintaining them, right? Keeping them healthy. And this big green pokey guy shows up. Um, what do you do about pests? Um, and weeds. Well, in, in vegetable gardens, particularly in containers and raised beds, you can typically manage for weeds pretty well just with hand pulling. Um, but you want to kind of talk to yourself and think about what's my acceptable uh, level of, of weeds in, in, in my garden. You know, if you have um, three four by eight raised beds, are you going to be really picky if you have a few of the spurge, which is the picture in the top, or a few oxalis, which is the picture in the bottom, popping up here and there, right? That might be um, not too much of a concern for you if you have that large space that you're working in. If you're working in a container, um, then you know it should be pretty easy to hand pull those weeds as they appear. Think about mulching. Um, one of the things that, that I really like to to do in, in my own garden is um, I like to use hay as a mulch in my vegetables only because of the light color um, can help with some pest issues. And, and also I just think it looks pretty. <laughs> um, but as uh, if you use mulch, it's gonna help with soil retention uh, soil moisture retention. It's also going to help with temperature regulation. And as it breaks down, it will add some organic uh, material to your soil as well. I would recommend that if you are going to use mulch in your vegetable garden, that you are not utilizing mulch um, from uh, like a municipal landfill source or something like chip drop that is just kind of a free source of mulch because you you don't really know what other things are chipped up in there. Um, I would recommend avoiding any dyed mulches as well. So, so like red mulch, black mulch, dyed brown mulch, avoid any of those if you're putting them in your vegetable garden. Um, <clears throat> we do have some, you know, common species. I think spurge and oxalis are some of the most common that you would see in a uh, just kind of a typical vegetable garden here in our area. But there are lots of other weeds that will pop up and um, that's what here, we're here for. Um, if you don't know what a weed is, you're not sure if it is a weed or you can't quite remember if you planted something in that spot and now the seedling has sprouted, um, you can send us a photo and we can try to help you identify that. 
you want to make sure that you know the good from the bad when it comes to insects. So the two pictures here, these are two baddies. We've got tomato hornworm and we have mealybugs, um, both of which can, can um, significantly impact your garden. Tomato hornworm for sure, you can go, uh, go away for one or two days and your entire tomato crop can be um, eaten. <laughs> um, so so how, do you, how do you manage for them? We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and there are other considerations, other types of pests, right? You're growing a food crop. So um, I know I personally have, have a hard time getting any cherry tomatoes or any blueberries from my home garden because I have a four-year-old <laughs> and uh, she does a really good job of going through the garden and, and, and eating all of those things before anybody else can get them. Um, maybe you have a dog that's really interested in what you're growing or maybe they like to dig. You need to think about some kind of exclusion um, uh, tactic to keep them out of that area. Rabbits and deer. Some folks that live out on our urban wildland interfaces have issues with rabbits and deer coming in and, and eating their vegetables as well. So think about other ways that you can kind of keep those pests um, away with fencing or netting. Um, or in the case of birds, sometimes you can use things like streamers or um, shiny, um, I've seen people use old CDs, um, things that are shiny to kind of scare the birds away. We will help you with any of these common problems. Um, that's what our plant diagnostic clinic is for. Our master gardener volunteers, which in Manatee County, we have 109 currently um, helping us out at our office. These are folks that go through an intensive 12-week uh, long course that teaches them um, horticultural concepts as well as management, identification of common pests and diseases. So these folks are real experts and um, they're here to help the public in, in answering some of these common questions. So weeds, diseases, insects, you got a weird spot, um, you found a weird bug, take a picture of it, a really good picture, um, not something blurry from 10 feet away, um, and email it to manatee.mg at gmail.com. And um, we will go ahead and we'll kind of sort those, um, those problems out and folks will get back to you and, and answer your questions with some really good resources. <clears throat> um, we did just get through kind of the lubber apocalypse, the uh, grasshoppers. Um, if you saw them, they're they, in their adult form. They're um, big yellow, grasshoppers about three to four inches long. Um, they were eating quite quite a lot of stuff about a month ago. They've, they've kind of uh, fizzled out a little bit now, um, but we do have some other types of insect pests that become a problem at different times of the year. And so we can, we can give you information about that as well. How do you address these um, insect pest problems as well as disease problems. Um, one of the things I really like to point to is integrated pest management. And I think that before we jump right to the question of like, what can I spray to, to kill this, right? We want to encourage people to think in this integrated pest management way, which is something that was really used in the commercial agriculture setting, um, but now is being um, it, it, it's being integrated much more frequently into the home, um, home landscape use. So you want to identify what pests might be there. You want to evaluate, um, are they causing damage? Are they causing significant damage? Are there things I can do to prevent them from getting um, onto my plants? Reflective mulches are a really good thing to consider. Action, are there different kinds of traps or baits that I could use rather than putting out some kind of a systemic insecticide? And then monitor the results of that action that you do. So <clears throat> IPM is a really great approach to managing your, um, managing your home garden. And then the last thing that I wanted to just put in here because I don't think we mention it enough, is use them, right? You've, you've put all that time and energy, use those crops that you grow, even if you only have a few stunted little green tomatoes, um, grill them, use them in a gazpacho, do something with them. Um, that way you're enjoying kind of the, the fruits of, of your labors. Um, you know, lettuces are gonna bolt in the summer heat, but pluck those little leaves off of there if they start to do it. And, and enjoy them and eat them. Don't forget those herbs. I see uh, a lot of folks kind of 
put herbs here and there um, among their plants and then through the summer the herbs are the only thing growing um, and they don't tend to get used. So herbs can be a great way to add flavor to your food without adding a lot of calories um, if you're you know, if, if you're concerned about that kind of stuff. So don't forget those herbs. If you need recipes, IFAS has another program that's called the Expanded Food and Education Nutrition Program. And they have a lot of great re, um, recipe resources. And I included the link here. You can check them out. Give yourself a break. This one's really important. It's easy to get disheartened when you first start gardening in Florida. It's hard. <laughs> we have high overnight humidity and temperature. We have a very extreme swing between our wet and our dry season. We have pests that don't die in the winter time. We have nematodes in our soil. Gardening in Florida is hard, but you can do it and we're here to help. Revel in your successes. Make sure that you just take time to pat yourself on the back, say, I grew one head of lettuce this year, and, and really take the time to, to be proud of, of that. And the more often you, you kind of pat yourself on the back and feel successful, the more you're gonna plant and the more likely you are to be successful. Don't give up, we're here to help. Um, again, our volunteer help email address is there. Um, we are currently not open to the public for walk-ins, but that will uh, resume at some point later in the summer and we'll be sure to let you know when that does. This is my email. You can email me directly. Check for your local county agent. If you're not here in Manatee County, um, check those district offices and figure out who your local county agent is and they'll be happy to, um, to help you out. When you're doing uh, searches for information on the internet, it's really easy to um, kind of get sidetracked by Joe's gardening blog. Um, make sure that the information that you're finding is good, reliable information. And you can do that by using these search terms. Use EDIS, E-D-I-S, or IFIS or UFIFIS Gardening Solutions, and you'll know that the resources you're getting are from a reliable source. Again, the reference, main reference for this presentation was the IFIS Backyard Vegetable Gardening Guide, as well as this publication, Vegetables for Southwest Florida in the Summer Months from Echo Farms. And that is the end of my presentation, and we will go ahead and um, I see that there are 17 questions in the Q&A. Um, I will go ahead and look at those and see, let's see here. <laughs> yep, I miss those juicy tomatoes too. <laughs> um, so there is a question about um, using reclaimed water for food crop irrigation. Some of the risks there are um, those that reclaimed water has really high concentrations of, of nutrients and occasionally uh, salts, and it can, it can cause some salt tolerance issues as well as legacy pharmaceuticals. So, um, you know, just consider the fact that we don't recommend you use reclaimed water. Um, you can use rainwater, uh, but I wouldn't recommend using reclaimed water. Pressure treated wood in raised beds. There hasn't been, um, a ton of research on that and now that they've switched from some of the um, some of the chemicals they used to use to uh, some some of the new chemicals for pressure treating I think that it's a little bit safer to do so um, but you know you can buy a cedar raised bed kit for for less than a hundred bucks nowadays so um, you know if you are concerned about those types of legacy chemicals and pressure treated wood then I, I would I would suggest opting for not um, the list of suggested varieties that are alternative kind of tropical crops would come from this Echo Farms um, publication that's on the screen right now. So vegetables for Southwest Florida in the summer months. There's uh, tons more um, varieties mentioned in that publication than I put on my slide. So that's a good um, good piece of information. Uh, somebody's asking where they can view on Facebook. We're streaming to Facebook Live right now on our UFIFIS Manatee County Extension page, um, and it will be available there. Um, let's see. 
Uh, Kim Klein, if you want to send me an email, I will send you that infographic. Yes, you can plant sweet potatoes now, but um, sweet potatoes are different than uh, normal potatoes in that they're gonna have one end of the sweet potato where you have the leaf growing and one end that has the roots growing. So if you're going to plant a sweet potato, it's better not to just cut um, a chunk of it unless you know uh, that you have both pieces. Corn. Corn is an interesting question. Um, there are some varieties of corn that you could plant. Now is not a good time to plant corn. But again, if you look at the IFAS Backyard Vegetable Gardening Guide, it will have um, suggested corn varieties. Uh-huh, yeah, so um, somebody is saying that there could be potential issues with rain barrel water for vegetables due to um, petroleum product runoff from the roof. And, and that's, that's true too. There could also be things like um, uh, bird droppings that could contain some bacteria. Uh, so if you're gonna use a rain barrel, you know, again, probably just use it in your landscape. A good place to find decent hay in Manatee County, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, you can go ahead and send me an email and I can forward that over to our livestock agent and I bet she would have a good answer. White flies, yes, white flies are nasty. Um, one of the best things to do with white flies is that the, the, like the first time you see them, you wanna go through with a strong stream of water and you wanna, you wanna blow them all off of your plant with a strong stream of water and then you can use, um, uh, you can use a contact insecticide when you see them as well. And there are some that are OMRI rated that would work. Um, there are some, um, uh, some products like, um, i trying to remember, the Organicide is one of them that can be used. Um, so there's, there's definitely options out there for white flies. They can, they can be really hard though. I had, I had the same problem with my tomatoes this year um, and I ended up pulling them all out and throwing them away and planting something else <laughs> um, because, the, because the white flies were, were just such a problem and, and they kept coming back. But, um, but I opted not to do any kind of um, inorganic pesticide. So if you, um, if you email me or email our manatmg at gmail.com, they can give you a list of suggested pesticides for that. Deer, uh, again, fencing is going to be the best option for deer. Um, there are some things like uh, repellents, but I have not seen any research that shows that those are uh, really effective. I am not sure when, um, when the county will start selling rain barrels again. Um, yeah. Uh, the county, Manatee County, is limiting um, public interaction right now. We still um, are not open to the public, our office. So as soon as we are open and available to the public, we will try to set up a way for us to get rain barrels to folks that want to get them set up um, during, during our rainy season. Um, leaves turning yellow could be from a number of different reasons. I would suggest sending us a picture, uh, could be too much fertilizer, could be too little fertilizer, could be too hot, could be too, um, too much water, could be not enough water. There's a lot of different reasons for, for yellowing leaves. Um, if your garden bed is close to an in-ground chlorine pool, I would just say try not to let the water from the pool splash over into your garden bed. And that might be a good opportunity for you to um, you know, maybe do a raised bed to keep it away from any potential um, overflow from the pool. Shannon is asking about tropical edibles. Send me an email and I can, I can give you some of that information from Echo Farms. Again, check out that publication that they put together, Vegetables for Southwest Florida in Summer Months. It's, it's really quite good. Um, soil for raised beds. Um, there are a lot of different options for getting soil. Um, I can't recommend a specific supplier, but I would look, if you're filling a raised bed, it's probably best to look for bulk options um, rather than buying them individually bagged, just because that's a lot of work to carry and empty all of those bags um, when you could get something, you know, 
a couple big bins filled uh, out at a bulk supplier and then dump them directly into the, um, into the bed. Not necessary. Uh, so there's a question about coastal environment with salty soil. Should there be a barrier between the raised bed and the native soil, assuming the raised bed is six to 12 inches? Um, no, it, it, it's not necessary. Um, you could put some weed cloth down, but it's really not going to do anything to, um, you know, it's really not going to do anything to prevent salt migration. You know, you think about most of the salts are going to be going down as the water percolates down through the soil. So I, I wouldn't recommend just because you live in a coastal area to have a, um, have some kind of a plastic barrier or anything like that. Um, down in between your two types of soil. You may want to consider container planting though um, because there can be issues with, um, you know, it, let's say that there's a strong storm coming through and you end up with a bunch of salt spray in the air coming into your raised bed. If you have containers, you can kind of pick them up and move them. Yes, good idea to plant the whole sweet potato. Where can you get soil tested? You can get your soil tested in our office. Um, you can bring it when we're open again to the public. You can bring it to our office and we can do pH and soluble salts in house. And if you want nutrient testing done, then we can send it up to, um, to the University of Florida labs. It's a really nominal fee and they'll, they'll come back with a nutrient analysis for you. <laughs> uh, somebody purchased some bags of raised bed soil and um, a dozen small mushrooms began to pop up throughout the soil. Shouldn't be a problem. Don't eat the mushrooms. <laughs> um, it's good. It means that there's a fungal community there um, unless there's something that would uh, eat your plants. But most, most mushrooms that are growing in garden soil like that, that are going to, um, you know, put put up their um, fruiting body from the soil are not going to be growing into your plants and causing a problem um, for plants. Uh, question, where do we get worms? Um, you can find online suppliers and some folks uh, locally will sell them. Again, you wanna look for the red wiggler. I believe that's Isenia fetida is the um, scientific name for the worms. But again, look for red wigglers. You don't want the uh, you know, big earthworms from up north. Uh, root weevil on your basil, kill the root weevil. Uh, and, you know, mm, consider using some kind of an insecticide, could be organic, could be um, inorganic. Mold looking substance on tomato plants. Send us a picture so that we know what we're looking at because it could be uh, sooty mold, it could be downy mildew. Um, there are some things, if it's mold-like, if it's dark, it could be sooty mold, which is actually a secondary symptom. That's the result of having something like aphids present. So aphids and mealybugs are going to produce a, a sticky um, a sticky substance that that sooty mold grows on. So it could be, um, could be what you have going on unless it's white, then it, then it could be a powdery mildew, which is a fungus, and then you want to use something that's a fungicide. Yeah, yeah, um, good point on the, um, you want to be sure that you have good, good straw um, with no seed heads. <clears throat> if you're using it as mulch, I incorrectly use the term hay, you're right, um, because you want to make sure you don't have any unwanted grass or weeds. Um, Trisha, I believe the rain barrels are $32, um, but I would have to look at that. Black eyed peas are certainly a variety that you can plant. Um, some mustard greens are going to do well right now. Um, you might be able to keep some collards alive as well through the time, um, through this time of year. Um, black eyed peas, bush beans, um, you know, I've got winged beans as well, um, long beans, any of the kind of like, um, I forget where they're, where they're from, um, but the long beans, like yard long beans, those will do well in the, in the summer as well. Uh, Jillian, who has a question about a hybrid tomato plant, please send us a picture. Um, you live in Miami, but we can help you. 
Okay. Uh, question about a sweet potato that grew roots in the pantry. Um, you can put the whole potato underground or you can put the root half in the ground and leave the other end exposed. Um, either way is fine. It, it, will, it will grow. All right, that is the end of our questions. And I have taken up a lot of your time, 315. Thank you so much for sticking with us and do look for the recording. Um, and I look forward to speaking with you and uh, <clears throat> helping you out in the future, all right? Thank you so much, everyone.